Okay, let's get started. A good morning and good afternoon and good evening from wherever you're dialing in from. By way of introduction, my name is Deborah Keller and I lead on the Impact for Breakfast Network, which is an initiative supported by Arthur Impact, the impact investing arm of the Rianta Capital Family Office. This specialized group has been gathering and growing since 2008, starting in London with an expansion today to 26 cities slash chapters around the globe. Our informal network consists of 2,900 members with shared interest and a desire to engage in monthly jam sessions about the challenges, models, mythologies, case studies, and ideas that help us each to better navigate and understand the space between social and financial return. Our objective with our informal gatherings is to help build relationships and learnings that drive action and ultimately capital into this sector. Our events and sessions are led by sector experts and are a safe space for brainstorming and deconstructing the most challenging questions we face in the impact space. Impact for Breakfast is an informal network of family offices, foundations, funds, venture philanthropy, and intermediary organizations with a common focus on social enterprise, entrepreneurship, and impact investing. Those who are here for the first time and wish to learn more about our network, you can visit our website, impactforbreakfast.com. I'll share the link to, uh, to it shortly in the chat field. Today, I have the pleasure to um, start and host the part two of our session on Mission Multiplier, how Swiss NGOs, foundations, and philanthropists can leverage impact investing. No worries if you have not attended part one. This session is not a continuation of the first one, but I will definitely share with you the link of the first session, which you are welcome to uh, see uh, the recording. In part two, we will focus on the role of the foundations can play in supporting social enterprises to strengthen their social and environmental impact and access funding. Before we uh, start with the session, I would like to introduce you to our fantastic speakers and moderators. You will see presentations today from Lade Araba, Executive Director of Alpha Mundi Foundation and Bernard Kirschbaum, Head of Division Global Corporation, a member of the Executive Board of HEX, Hilfswerk of the Evangelische Kirche in Schweiz. And our co-hosts today and wonderful colleagues, I have with me also Tim Raddy, Founder of and Managing Director of Alpha Mundi Group, and Frederick Berne, Head of Products and Risk at iGravity. Before we dive in in today's topic and then hand over to Tim, uh, a few housekeeping rules before we get started. I want to inform you that this session is being recorded. I will share the recording with you in a follow-up note, which you're welcome to pass along to your colleagues or network, anyone that needs to see the content shared today. After the presentation, which will take approximately one hour, we'll move over to Q&A and the discussion round. I want to remind you that this is an informal group, so please feel free to share your thoughts, comments, questions, ideas, anything that crosses your mind, we'd love to hear it. And if you can think of a question during the presentations, you can also use the chat field to drop them there. We'll do our best to cover all of them during the Q&A. And now with no further ado, over to you, Tim. Thank you so much, Deborah. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, so maybe just a bit of background on, on the origins of this series. Uh, why do we need to, to, to have these conversations about how to leverage the resources and knowledge of foundations, philanthropists, and NGOs uh, through different instruments and impact investing in particular? Um, this year, the United Nations uh, relayed that the price for the Sustainable Development Goals has increased because when we got started on this journey of the SDGs, um, they were indicating that we needed to invest $2.5 trillion per year to help achieve the SDGs by 2030. And this year they've announced that we actually need to invest $4 trillion per year. And this is because uh, of delays and inaction on multiple fronts in the financing and implementation of the SDGs. So you can see how it is very important to leverage every dollar that we have at our disposal for sustainable development, and also to leverage the knowledge that many of us have earned the hard way through a long uh, standing practice of development 
in order to to uh, have better more efficient and more effective solutions and and do that as quickly as possible before certain tipping points are reached. Uh, we know from the, the Sharm el Sheikh COP27 uh, that we're now in a 2.5 degrees uh, climate uh, change scenario, uh, not the 1.5 that we had originally planned to keep. And, um, and we know that from the pandemic, social inclusion has suffered tremendously. Uh, and you know the, the gender agenda has been set back uh, but by more than 50 years uh, because of the pandemic, according to the World Economic Forum. So there's a number of, of key challenges. I won't go through all of them, you know, oceans pollution, plastics, the Amazon burning, that really need us to be as smart as we can be with the capital that we have and the knowledge that we have. Um, and and uh, it's not always easy uh, to be as efficient as we can be because we are all constrained by regulatory frameworks. Right. So in, in the course of this series uh, that we'll go into next year, the collaboration with uh, with Impact for Breakfast, Alpha Mundi and iGravity, we will try to address multiple dimensions of, of the constraints and opportunities for foundations, philanthropists and NGOs to really leverage their capital and their knowledge for sustainable development. Um, with regards to, to my own practice, um, so I'm the founder of Alpha Mundi Group. We're based in Switzerland. Uh, we are 100% dedicated to impact investing. Uh, we've invested more than $100 million in, uh, in social enterprises in Latin America and, and Africa over a decade. We've also created a, a nonprofit foundation in 2017 in the US, and you will hear from uh, the foundation's activities from, from Lady, its executive director. And we did that because it is very important to the extent possible to be able to operate across as many stages of the capital continuum as, as you can, right? Because um, if we're gonna scale up the solutions, very often we see that it begins with philanthropy, right? Philanthropy is the, the, uh, the perfect form of risk capital because it can, it can you know, grant um, support to new ideas, uh, to new business models, to new partnerships, uh, to new talent, new technology. And when the models have proven themselves through pilots, then impact investors can step in and scale them up. And ultimately, in some cases, we will be able to pass the model over to, to mainstream capital, right? If you think about the $4 trillion that we need per year to invest in the SEGs, private philanthropy and public development um, assistance will not be sufficient, right? If, if you look at private philanthropy, according to the reports we get from the US per year, we're looking at about $200 billion in donations. The US is of course the biggest philanthropy, private sector philanthropy market in the world. So if you imagine that the rest of the world gives at least as much as the US, you're still only getting to about four to $500 billion per year. That is a, a long way from the 4 trillion that we need to finance the transition to sustainability worldwide. And, and the same thing for, for the, uh, the development assistance. There is a target among OECD countries to donate 0.7% of GDP. Most of the OECD countries are not uh, achieving that level. They're below it. Uh, and so we're looking at about 150 to 200 billion in public development assistance on an annual basis. So you can see how we all need to work together to design solutions across the capital continuum in order to finance the transition to sustainability before certain tipping points are reached. And that is the purpose of this series. Um, so without further ado, I will pass on the words to uh, Frederick Bernie of iGravity. He will be your moderator for this conversation and introduce the panelists, thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you you stay connected through the the future editions of this webinar series. My thanks, Frederick. Over to you. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be there in uh, the attempt to leverage impact investing. For those who don't know, iGravity, that's exactly um, what we're trying to do on, on on different fronts. But rather than being too long, I, I would just say. We're trying to cover the entire spectrum of impact investing, and one is really to to help consult foundation and DFI in mobilizing philanthropic money into impact. That's how we do, and and also helping people looking at the the impact measurement framework that we need to do. Uh, but at the same time, we are also doing investments. So we're really advising on investments, both on a direct way, where we're basically helping catalytic investment for, for reaching high impact companies, and as well on a diversified front for the, the family office and the wealth managers to, that want to access impact investing with a, with a meaningful return. 
so that creates quite an interesting spectrum for us. Um, and we are also at the forefront of trying to implement blended finance uh, initiatives. So last year, we, we launched a first note, which basically helps uh, financing small enterprise in Kenya and in Nigeria, uh, while at the same time, we have a small de-risking uh, given by a foundation that helps uh, taking the first loss for 10 to 20%. So I think that gives you a bit of an idea why we're here and why we're very much engaging in the, in the, in the webinar of today with Alpha Mundi, um, as we realize that there is a lot of new initiative going on that are not really spread over and, and that we're trying to, to get the knowledge to all of you as to what one can do with, um, with philanthropic money to, to leverage impact investing. And for this today, we have two exciting projects, um, implementation that we will go into detail. Um, we have Lade Araba with us today, um, which is the executive director of the Alpha Mundi Foundation, as it was mentioned. Lada is a tremendous experience, more than 20 years in the field. Uh, she was previously the, the head of Africa for Convergence. Uh, for those who don't know Convergence, it's the most recognized blended finance uh, foundation in the world and the leader in, in that expense. Um, and also Lada has various board membership and, and membership of different committee at the Green Outcome Fund, for instance, or the African Risk Capacity. Um, and she's also the founder and president of the Vigiola Foundation. And then on the other side, we have Bernard Kerschbaum, um, which has a pleasure to join us here today. He is um, the head of international division of HEX. That's the, the German name. Um, it's called also EPER in French, for those who don't know, and a, a little bit more easier to understand for everybody is the Swiss Church Aid uh, in Switzerland. Um, Bernard is overseeing a budget of 40 million, uh, which is uh, investing in different countries. Um, HEX has 16 offices, 200 projects in more than 30 countries in the world today. Uh, previous to that, Bernard was uh, a country director in Sri Lanka and also in Afghanistan for ZOA, the Refugee uh, Care uh, Association. And he also holds some position at KFW, uh, overseeing some public private partnership implementation. So I think we have two extremely experienced people here today, and I hope we'll, we'll be able to, to leverage their knowledge to, to make you uh, feel a little bit what, what these two are really implementing on the ground in Africa today. And for that, I will give the word to Lade to, to start uh, introducing what she does. Thank you so much, Frederick. And good morning to everybody. I'm super excited to be with you here this morning um, to share a little bit about Alpha Mundi Foundation as we've entered into a new medium term strategy and also to talk about ways in which um, organizations such as yourselves can be catalytic towards um, achieving the SDGs and really driving um, impact in all of your engagements. I have a couple of slides, um, so I'm not sure if it's Morgan who's sharing. Uh, please feel free to go ahead. Um, let me start by just kind of walking you through the journey that Alpha Mundi Foundation has taken to get to this new strategy that we adopted in June. Um, we've been operating since 2018. Um, so as Tim mentioned, uh, you know, founded in 2016 in the US and has really focused on providing gender smart technical assistance to SMEs, both in Africa as well as Latin America. And we have seen um, significant impact both in terms of the performance of these companies, so improving their financial performance, but also creating positive externalities for women um, and youth within their workforce, um, their supply chains, and also the customers and consumers that they serve. Um, if we go to the next slide, I just want to show you some highlights um, of the work that we have done before I delve into uh, this new strategy and then speak about an example of a blended finance transaction that we undertook um, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. So if we could advance to the next slide, um, you'll see that 
I'm not sure if my slide is showing. It is. Okay, fantastic. Then, it, then the issue is <laughs> on my end. Um, so what you'll see is that uh, we have worked across you know, a number of different uh, themes um, as well as sectors. We provided TA, um, different types of TA, and ultimately the beneficiaries um, have noticed a significant improvement um, in their operations uh, in this manner. So I just, I won't dwell too much on this, but you'll see that we have a pretty diversified portfolio, if you will, where we have, um, We've operated, um, you know, we supported companies with operations in about 12 countries. We have, you know, 52 completed projects. We have 19 that are still ongoing. Um, mostly we have supported companies that operate in the sustainable food and agriculture, renewable energy, as well as financial services sectors. And this covers, you know, everything from microfinance to FinTech. Increasingly, we're also starting to support more companies that have a technology ang uh, angle. And what we've noticed is that for the majority of these companies, they have been able to report an increase in revenues. A number of them, you know, have since uh, become EBITDA positive. They have continued to create jobs. Um, and very importantly, they themselves have realized the value of creating um, you know, companies that really incorporate a gender lens into their DNA. So as I mentioned earlier, this is both internally and externally. Some of the ways in which you know, they are being intentional about this is by building the capacity of their management teams and ensuring that they have stronger female representation um, as well as thinking about you know, even within their supply chains, being intentional about working with women owned uh, companies. Um, so trying to integrate them into their supply chains, thinking about how female customers utilize their products and services, because oftentimes women have significant influence over household purchase decisions. And if they are not consulted um, in the design or if in their distribution channels, they're not really thinking about how they can reach uh, these female customers or at least, you know, female um, household members, then they're not fully leveraging their total addressable market. So we've helped these companies through a variety of technical assistance projects to uh, develop better strategies internally. And ultimately, as I said, you know, it has created uh, positive benefits, um, both uh, financially as well as in social terms. Most of our activities have focused, um, are focused in Africa, but we do um, also have companies that we support in Latin America, and we will be looking to increase our exposure within Latin America as well. Um, we can move to the next slide, please, which just shows you at a very high level, um, the different types of uh, TA projects that we have provided. So mostly supporting operations so improving business performance, but we've also supported companies in undertaking uh, feasibility studies. So whether it's to develop new products or services to better understand you know, how they can design those products and services. And we've also provided TA for um, other types of engagements within uh, the companies. So that's historically what the foundation has, do has done. And we have supported uh, portfolio companies uh, within the Alpha Mundi Group, um, the two funds that are managed by the Alpha Mundi Group but going forward, we're also kind of expanding that focus. And let me kind of, you know, let me walk you through our thinking behind this. Uh, what we've noticed is that the majority of companies, uh, and this is similar both in Africa as well as Latin America, the majority of companies are simply not investable. So if we anecdotally look at um, our origination efforts, for every hundred companies that we screen, once we've gone through our appraisal, you know, evaluation due diligence, we ultimately may be able to place capital into two. So that means that only 2% anecdotally again, only 2% of companies are investable. So what's happening with the 98%? Um, there are a number of market failures that undermine the performance of SMEs uh, within these emerging markets. Um, and I won't go through all of them, but what we find is that you know, many of these companies are not able to then grow and scale their operations. When you look within the African context in particular, you find that we have a lot of small companies. We have a few 
uh, that are medium size. Um, and then, you know, we have even fewer that tend to be large. In a normal life cycle, you would expect, you know, to see a series of companies that are early stage startups, you know, growing companies, mature companies, and then of course it's a bell curve. So ultimately you have a decline, but within the African context, we have a cluster of companies that remain in that small, um, you know, in that small size uh, phase of growth and they never mature or progress into uh, a larger scale company, which is what you see in developed markets. So what this means is that there are barriers that are preventing these companies from growing. And it's not always just financial, it's, it's things like, you know, management capacity, the ability to find the right talent, um, understanding research and development. So with some of the companies that we've worked with, we realized that they were creating products and services, you know, based on their own assumptions and not necessarily going out into the field, you know, doing any market research, engaging with potential customers. And so obviously, once they launched some of these products and services, they weren't really adapted to their market. So they did not perform as well in terms of their sales volumes. Um, so helping these companies to understand research and development, sales and marketing, you know, distribution, and some of these other basic, um, you know, softer uh, type of uh, skills is really important. Um, so once we do this, what we find is that if we're really trying to create impact that is long-term and sustainable and transformational, we need to help more companies to be able to grow, to survive that valley of death, and then ultimately to become commercially viable to the point that they're able to raise uh, capital on commercial terms on the strength of their own fundamentals and financials. So um, not continuing to depend on grants, or donor funding, but actually evolving to the point where, again, they're EBITDA positive, any investor would, you know, undertake their appraisal and determine that this is a company worth investing in. We want to see more companies graduating um, through that process and being able to access capital throughout the capital continuum. And we think, you know, our theory of change is if we can help more of these companies get to that point, then we are being very strategic and leveraging, you know, um, catalytic capital, which is quite limited, as Tim mentioned in his introduction, to ensure that, you know, more private commercial capital is then able to invest in things that are creating impact. And we want this to happen also because if you think about the global pandemic and the global recession that happened in the last couple of years, a number of uh, companies went bust. So imagine we're talking about medium and large companies, small companies, we also um, noticed a number of them had to lay off staff, many went bankrupt, went into insolvency. So what that means is, you know, all, all those companies that had received grant funding and had been operating, had created jobs, had created social impact, that impact has been lost and most likely will not be recovered. So what we wanna do is ensure that we are making impact investable, but also sustainable. We don't want impact to be vulnerable to external shocks, such as a global pandemic or even changing donor priorities where funding then shifts to humanitarian assistance. Um, we want to ensure that um, impact once created is sustainable and is able to grow and continue to scale. So this is where you know, the concept of blended finance um, comes in. Blended finance ultimately, you know, and I'm using Convergence's definition. Um, I, I was with Convergence as, as Frederick mentioned. Um, blended finance is really just a financial structuring approach. You're leveraging uh, concessional capital, whether it's from public or philanthropic sources to de-risk transactions. In this case, you know, de-risk companies that would otherwise not be able to raise capital and therefore catalyzing private investment. So the way that we like to summarize it again is making the SDGs investable. So think about it from that perspective is making impact investable because in the long run, that's how you maintain the impact and that's how you continue to you know, drive uh, the sustainable development goals and ensure that we are closing that huge funding gap which now exceeds the two and a half trillion dollars that we were um, speaking about before the COVID-19 pandemic. So that is at a high level what blended finance um, is intended to do. And it's very complementary to impact investing because impact investors form part of the capital continuum given that they are pursuing a dual mandate and um, 
you know, there are varying levels of risk appetite. So you will have some impact investors who are more focused in their earlier riskier stages where there's a lot of impact and maybe the risk adjusted returns are not as um, attractive. And then later stage, you might have other impact investors who are still pursuing impact, but then also have a requirement to generate, you know, um, higher uh, financial returns. So everybody can participate in uh, you know, impact without necessarily altering their core mandates, be they purely impact focused, a mix, or even uh, commercially focused. So um, to give you an example, as I, as I kind of wrap up, um, our, our new strategy, medium term strategy over the next five years is really focused again on not just providing gender smart technical assistance to SMEs, but also um, to ensure that more companies, as I mentioned, um, are investable, investment ready, are able to attract commercial capital because we want to see income generation, jobs, and so on, and positive externalities um, to these emerging markets. We know that countries really cannot develop or industrialize if they don't have um, basic uh, public goods and services, infrastructure, uh, SMEs, which are the lifeline. If you look at developed markets, for instance, there are a lot of um, you know, SMEs that create jobs and they are the lifeline of those economies. Um, in Africa and to a certain extent in Latin American countries, we're not seeing that critical mass of these SMEs. Um, so we wanna be sure that as part of our impact that we are supporting these companies in this way. So that is you know, the context behind this uh, directional shift in uh, the foundation's uh, mission and also in our strategy. So to summarize, I wanna share with you the example of one of our portfolio companies, um, Sun Culture, um, which basically um, you know, is a company that's based in Kenya. It provides affordable uh, solar powered irrigation solutions for smallholder farmers through a pay as you grow business model. Um, this model is, is quite simple. Um, it provides affordable financing plans to smallholder farmers so that they can immediately purchase these solar powered um, irrigation pumps and use the products to improve their agricultural productivity, ultimately the income that they're earning and so on. Now, when the pandemic hit in 2020, uh, Sun Culture faced a very difficult, uh, well, many difficult decisions, but I wanna focus on one in particular. It was forced to halt the pay grow loans um, as a means to preserve cash and also to protect the credit quality of its loan portfolio. Obviously, if you are providing uh, products on credit to smallholder farmers, they are, the, they are not uh, generally considered credit worthy. Um, so they are a risky uh, customer base and you know, any fluctuation in their income levels means that they are unable to service their loans. So the company had to think about this um, for its own, uh, uh, you know, for its own, uh, to maintain its own health. Um, and they also needed to try to um, think about some solutions to this. Now, it could have, the company could have increased its prices. Um, it could have been exclusionary, meaning that it was only serving, um, you know, the larger farmers who were more established. But if it had done this, and it, it would have deviated from its own core mission, which is also to create this impact and to support an often overlooked and unserved customer base. So Alpha Mundi uh, partnered, uh, Alpha Mundi Foundation partnered with uh, FSD Kenya uh, to structure a second loss guarantee facility, which is a type of blended finance instruments to help to mitigate this risk while also enabling some culture to continue raising capital. Um, in the first phase, we structured this in two phases. So in the first phase, which is the first 12 months, the facility would cover any cash flow shortfalls uh, from the portfolio. So existing loans as well as new loans. And then in the second phase beyond 12 months, depending on the credit performance of these loans, um, the facility would also cover up to 25% of losses within the portfolio. Overall, this is a $200,000 facility and it created a financial buffer for the anticipated increase in non-performing loans given the customer profile that I described in this pay growth program. It covered the cash flow shortfalls 
therefore enabling these customers to also negotiate payment deferrals, you know, restructuring, and all the uh, short-term solutions to accommodate any challenges and uncertainty created by the pandemic. Um, now, I'm very happy to report that, you know, from this, you know, quite modest facility, um, Sun Culture has been able to catalyze 11 million dollars in pay grow and inventory working capital uh, to fund the growth of its portfolio over the next two years um, since the pandemic um, and its portfolio is projected to then grow to include 17,700 customers with outstanding uh, pay grow receivables of about 12.4 million dollars um, now this working capital facility was arranged by SunFunder which is an expert in solar finance and has investments from impact investors such as Solar Energy Transformation Fund, um, the Facility for Energy Inclusion, uh, an Off-Grid Energy Access Fund, the Nordic Development Fund, Alpha Mundi, as well as uh, Triodos. So if I was to you know, summarize this in, in one or two sentences, I would say that our facility helped to increase um, investor confidence and comfort therefore avoiding um, upward revisions to the interest rates that the customers would have been uh, charged um, and also enabling Sun Culture as a company to continue to raise capital. So we saved um, the company and we also helped the company to you know, save its uh, customer base. So that's just one example of how you can leverage blended finance and be very catalytic because as I said, we went from a $200,000 facility to enable this company to then raise you know, that additional $11.4 million um, facility. So I will pause there. Um, I think <laughs> there are a lot of comments, uh, so this happy is... to answer those whenever thank Frederick. Uh, yes, of course, Lady, thank, thank you. you. This is. This is excellent and, and very enlightening to see these concrete uh, cases example. We have quite a lot of comment questions on the on the investable and, and the addressing uh, positive EBITDA SMEs. I think I, I would like to keep this as a discussion after Bernard present, uh, but there's a couple other small questions maybe you could answer, Lade. For instance, um, maybe talk about the region, regional biases in Africa, if there are any, that could be interesting. And another question is whether you engage in natural based projects, for example, forestry. O over to you, Rade, if you, if you want to address these two questions. Oh, I thought you said uh, to go after Bernard. So um, no, no, the I think, first I think question was, what sorry, go, have... go ahead, Frederick. Yes, I, I may mean, have if, missed you. If you could comment on, on, on the one which are more specific to your activities, so whether you do natural based uh, funding so involving in natural forestry, for instance. Um, so historically, we have focused, you know, as I mentioned, uh, primarily on those three sectors. Um, the renewable energy, uh, most of those companies are providing solar uh, solutions for irrigation, you know, uh, commercial and industrial customers, um, as well as sustainable food and agriculture. Um, so we haven't, you know, intentionally supported any nature-based solutions. Um, but again, you know, going forward, our new mission and, and strategy is um, a bit wider and broader in its scope. Um, so we will be looking at, you know, those types of um, uh, other sectors as well uh, going forward. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and let me keep the other questions for, for after, as I, as I mentioned, on, on this uh, investable uh, criteria, which I think there's a lot of uh, comments to, to share there. So I would propose to move to, to Bernard and X, and, and have you presented uh, your way of investing in Africa, Bernard? Over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Frederick, and also a warm welcome from, from, from my side to, to each one of you. I hope you see the screen because yes. I heard excellent. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation and it's a privilege for me to, to share here. And, you know, I consider myself nor my organization expert in impact investment, but we are on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a learning journey and um, on a steep learning curve as well. So that's what we want to share with you where we are at and, and why we why we do what we what we do at the moment. Um, if, if I just 
want to share a few words about us that you know who we are. Um, we are actually an old NGO in Switzerland here. We are the fifth or sixth largest NGO in Switzerland. We were founded uh, 75 years ago um, and since then constantly adapted and developed. And we have still uh, quite a big program here in Switzerland where we provide legal counsel for asylum seekers and inclusion pro uh, programs for migrants and long-term unemployed, et cetera. So, so that's our Swiss space. And then we have the global division. That's, that's the area I'm, I'm active in. Um, and we, we basically work um, on development uh, cooperation topics, on humanitarian aid topics, and on development policies. And we are very much concerned with how people access basic services, so be it in, in natural or, or man-made crises, um, where we are active, we are in really complex uh, crises such as uh, um, Syria, uh, Venezuela, uh, uh, Myanmar, DRC, or, or uh, now Ukraine, of course. Um, we are very much concerned with how people access land and how they can protect the land and how they can live on, on the land. So that's our natural core core topic uh, for, for small holder families in, in rural areas. And then we have a number of, of projects and programs in the field of inclusion, where we promote um, you know, the inclusion of marginalized groups. Uh, that could be Roma communities in Eastern Europe or Dalit Adivasis in India and Bangladesh, people who are excluded from mainstream societies on a social, political, or economic level. And we, we counter that with a number of programs and, and partners. And all what we do, we try to link to a policy level where we influence policies, uh, practices, um, through lobbying advocacy work on a global level as well as here in Switzerland. We, we have, a, as Frederick already mentioned, uh, we have a total turnover of almost 100 million now, um, about 50 million globally, 50 million here, here in Switzerland. We're reaching more than 100, uh, 1 million people um, per, per year. We, we do projects ourselves, but we also work with uh, a number of partners. We have a portfolio of 100 uh, local organizations from very small ones until very mature uh, national partner organizations because we strongly believe in investing and developing a local civil society. And we do that in more than 30 countries. Uh, we have 20 offices abroad. And you see most of our staff are, are nationals and, and based in the respective context. So this is actually what we do. This is our core business. We, we collect these 100 million on an annual basis from, from bilateral donors, uh, institutional donors, from foundation, from churches, from the public. And this is our grant money. And then we disperse that and invest that in projects. So, so how did we get into the field of, of investments and, and, and returns? And that, that's a bit of a journey. And I just give you a few uh, snapshots of, of, of our journey. Actually, it started already in the 90s, long before there was any microfinance hype around that. Uh, you know, we, we started with, with creating uh, saving and, 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 and uh, credit uh, unions, basically, in, in, in areas, rural areas in Romania, in, in Georgia, in Moldova, and basically, all these partners, they are now nowadays they are full-fledged microfinance banks, and they can easily refinance themselves. But the capital that we invested those days is still there, and it multiplied. So, so basically, there, there we have a, a seed money of five million, where these banks actually no longer lead our finances, and we were thinking, what do we do with it? Do we just uh, use it in regular programs, or do we start something similar? And that's where we said, hey, we want to. Uh, get involved in the uh, in the impact investment field and primarily in in Africa. We also learned a lot in our regular programs projects when it comes to the limitations of grants and donations um, in in kind of more business like projects where we have uh, like value chains where we develop value chains where we develop markets around a certain product or services where we basically finance projects over the years, each year with grant money, but we learned it kind of prevented the business model to take off, uh, to take enough ownership, to take enough, enough risks. Um, and therefore, we also said if for some cases, it's better if we change our financing modality to loans or, or, or equity in, in investments. 
And then we we did our first direct investments. We invested in some 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 local partners uh, in some. Uh, also Swiss companies that work with us on export value chains, um, but it was not easy for us. <laughs> As you can imagine, this is not our core business. It comes on top of our regular work. Uh, we are not really um, seen as, as a hard lender because we are this NGO, it's usually a soft lender. Uh, we, we really had a lack of resources and, and capacity when it comes to screening, uh, you know, uh, examining companies and, and really managing a, a, lo a loan portfolio. So that, that we said we need help. We need to, we need to seek, uh, we need to find strategic partners for us. So we did the first strategic investment in, in Truvalu Group, that's in the Netherlands. Uh, also um, an, an investor that invests only in, in um, companies along the agricultural value chain. So just for us to learn more about how to build a portfolio, how to, how to manage uh, investments. And then we, after that initially bigger investment, we said, okay, we want to start something ourselves here, here in Switzerland. Um, and we, we, we look for a strategic partner. So that's where we partnered with iGravity to, to build uh, an investment facility that we can scale and that we can other, others uh, invite to, to, to join as well. So we, we created this rural livelihoods investment facility that, that's where we are at, at the moment. Focus is very clear on Sub-Saharan Africa. It's on rural communities um, and it's on, on, on provided, providing um, basically loans um, and, and technical assistance to, to SMEs. There we kind of shaped, sharpened that further and said it's, it's primarily in the field of agriculture, because that's very close to what we do as, as, as an NGO. Uh, so we, we look at everything along an, an, an agricultural value chain. That, that is our prime focus when we're looking for investments. And then we also look at all the related sector that, that it can be water, that can be energy and access to finances, especially or only for, for productive use and uh, not for, for, for consumption. So we, that's how we said we provide debt financing, technical assistance, and also build up a, a solid imp impact measurement. And that's also where we, we have the support of, of iGravity, basically, where we measure our financial performance along our, our social and in the impact performance. And there we, we try, try to link that to our regular impact measurement system that we have as an NGO, um, where we report globally against, but also then against the SDGs and other international uh, standards. Initially, we uh, focus now on Uganda and Senegal. That was where, where iGravity and us, we were already present. That's the first phase, not to uh, uh, basically spread out too thinly, too, too soon, and really focus on two uh, contexts, build a network, uh, build a pipeline of, of companies we can invest in, and also basically ensure that we can accompany them through through the investment phase. And then in the second phase, we would like to expand that further. And you see some of the countries that are currently on, on, on our watch list uh, there. I give you one brief example, um, just to give you an idea about these companies. Um, so we, we, we made now up to four investments now uh, that we closed the deals. Um, uh, I think another of four or five are in the stage of closing, and then we have uh, we have still uh, a pipeline to 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 work. With. So this is a, a, a milling company, Landmark Millers. Um, we we provided a loan of 400k for for four years uh, to basically scale up the the processing facility. Um, the the company reached out up to now to 9,000 farmers. With our investment, they, they will onboard another 4,000 farmers, um, be it for maize, uh, for grains, and all kinds of, of products. And the nice thing also there is this is not for export, or this is really for uh, food security and food sovereignty in, in the context of Uganda. So that really goes back to the community's uh, better, high quality uh, uh, food su supply. Um, and we also, learn a lot pre-investment and during the due diligence phase where are kind of the bottlenecks in the company 
here we, 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 we work on financial control to work on governance structure where we say we, 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 we saw the willingness to, to work on that, to, to, to progress there. And that's where we also come alongside and then with TA uh, to work on that. The same as then also on, and that's basically also our core business uh, to, to work on farmers le level um, to improve agriculture practices uh, to promote organic farming to, to care better for for the environment and biodiversity so this is kind of one 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 snapshot of our of a, of a typical investment that's a usually our ticket size that we have up to now between 200,000 and 500,000 uh, usd um and bernard yes before you go one question that came around here is what is your view on the on the sustainable biofuel is that something of a topic for you? And how do you see that? Biofuel? Yes. Um, we have, of course, we have an internal discussion about that. Um, we, have, we have not invested in it. We see, we see it um, critically when it basically crowds out uh, um, crops for, 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 for food yeah, and nutrition. Uh, and that's that's that that's the basically where we 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 also it's it's not uh, basically for us um, return first it's really impact first and and uh, uh, there we also have a lot of critical voices inside the organization that really keep keep us focused there. Uh, so I guess uh, really food sovereignty uh, local markets uh, in countries where communities can cater for their own nutritional needs and also counter uh, shocks that they constantly face through climate change and, and, and calamities. And I think that's, that's, that's increasingly important for us. So therefore, we would, we would uh, look at it very careful um, if we would have that, uh, that, 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 that option to finance. Um, just on the last slide, and maybe that also then part for the discussion, uh, so we decided to to start that we wanted to to find out is is there a niche where we say we we worked under the assumption there is a missing middle where there are, are there's microfinance there are rural areas there are commercial banks but they don't get together so something is uh, there that there's some, some some have a capital need that is above the minor microfinance uh, structure and sometimes they're not really picked up for a number of reasons uh, from from commercial uh, uh, banks and, and uh, we said that if they, if this is a, the missing middle, we want to be there. We can bear that risk. Um, we we are there on the ground with our own teams. We have a local knowledge and context uh, knowledge, and so we want to prove is that is that feasible? Uh, that's where we are in this stage. We so we have learned a lot which companies to screen. Uh, have a pre-selection process that. Are, so we, we work with iGravity, what kind of comp companies fit into our, our mandate, uh, relate also to us as an, an NGO, which, which sectors we would exclude, and then basically um, <coughs> take them through a, a due diligence process. Um, we still have discussions on how we, we set that up legally. Right now, uh, HEX in Switzerland, we are a foundation. Um, so we, we have several considerations to basically transfer that into a, into a company so we also can easy, more easily onboard other, other investors. We are still in, in the process of setting up the impact metrics more, more in details. And of course, as you can imagine, at the moment before for investments, there's still a high risk in the portfolio. Uh, so the de-risking the portfolio, managing the transaction cost, uh, that's sort of something we, we, we are, we are working on and to basically uh, put that to scale uh, in, in um, over the next few years. But basically, we just do it now for 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 one one year. The actual investment phase, so, so we are really at the at the at the early early stage. As said, we have um, a good pipeline uh, of companies in Senegal and and Uganda. Um, we, we are in in talks with other investors to onboard them. We are open for that. We we don't want to have this as a our NGO. Brand, uh, but really may leave something lasting behind. So very much open for for strategic okay. investors to come on and to partner with us and to really establish that. Uh, it's really hands-on. Uh, it, it's really very close to to the entrepreneurs and to the companies, uh, and therefore we can also utilize our our local presence on on the ground and and leverage it adequately. 
So that's our venture and that's our adventure. <laughs> we we are we are on and uh, we're grateful for the partnership we have with, with iGravity uh, and and others to to take that forward. We we strongly believe in it. It's a complement uh, uh, for our regular uh, grant work that we do globally. Um, we we. We, we, we have access to these entrepreneurs. We are on the ground and can go with them uh, through, through that investment period. So that's that's where we are at. And that's what I, I wanted to share with you. And I'm curious what you think and what, what, what um, your thoughts are. Thanks uh, for your attention and back to you, Frederick. Thank you, Bernard, for this uh, enlightening presentation. Um, there's a, a few questions there, and then we, we also prepare a question. Let, let me start this one question to, to both of you, you know, because I think we mentioned a few times impact first, and then there were a lot of questions coming up. So, okay, what is investable when we are looking at impact first? Um, uh, there were a few questions looking as well. Are there regional biases in Africa? Can we look at each country or region uh, differently? And, and I guess the question is, where, where do you see the, the need for a return in, in that impact first um, investments that you both do? Maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that because I see you know, the EBITDA, is it necessary to see coming? And if you may not have it right away, when you start investing, you know, what sort of criteria would you look into to make sure it comes later? Um, I guess it's a very various question, but I'm sure uh, people may react to, to your comment as well, and we can elaborate a little bit on this uh, impact first uh, topic. I, I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, Lade, maybe? Um, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of subjectivity. Um, it's more of an art than a science, but I think ultimately the bottom line is um, you are most likely managing um, assets on behalf of somebody else, you have a fiduciary responsibility. So even if you're investing for impact, you still need to ensure that you are doing so in a responsible manner and that you're able to generate some type of risk adjusted return, you know, for the asset owner um, or your LPs if you're a fund manager. Again, within the capital continuum, there's different, you know, requirements. Investors have different requirements. Some are happier with a more modest return. Others want a more aggressive return. So I think operating within those parameters is important. But as I really try to highlight and underscore, um, if you want your impact to be sustainable, you can't decouple it from the commercial viability of your investments. Um, you can provide grants, you can provide philanthropic funding, but when these companies who are already quite vulnerable are exposed to further external shocks, most of them will not survive unless they have you know, internal resilience um, within their operations and financially are robust and they have pretty strong fundamentals. So I think that as we are focused on driving that impact, we really cannot decouple it from um, ensuring the commercial viability or long-term financial sustainability um, of these companies. Um, I do think that there are biases in Africa and the data shows it, but what you'll find again, you know, from the data is that the risk perception is higher in Africa than it is for Latin America and even Asia, South and Southeast Asia. But in reality, the types of risk adjusted returns that investors are able to earn in Africa are more attractive than what they would earn in Latin America or Asia. And also default rates in Africa are significantly um, lower than what you find in those other two emerging markets. And there's a number of reports that have been published on this. Um, Moody's has done a report on it. The World Bank has reports on it. So there are multiple sources of data. So, but unfortunately what that means in, in practice is that given the higher risk perception, there's also a higher risk premium that is attached to investments in Africa, which means that you're either increasing the cost of capital or investors are having to take a haircut um, if they're making investments. So, for there is, and this is also because of the information asymmetry. So blended finance, not being a silver bullet, but as one of the solutions that you can leverage to address this type of issue, blended finance helps to um, 
minimize uh, the need for this higher risk premium and basically keep the cost of capital um, reasonable so that investors can earn whatever risk adjusted return that they're after without necessarily, um, you know, uh, I think making the transaction less attractive. So that, that's just a reality. There's a reason you have so many investors who are coming into Africa and they never leave. Um, so there's a lot of time. <laughs> you're making, a huge, case for, you're making a huge case for Africa. I find that super interesting. I, I, I am. So I'd be those, very interesting to. Know, yeah. yeah. No, I think it's, know, it's really the case for uh, for blended finance. If 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 really the the risk perception is so badly biased towards Africa versus other country, then you know it's a no brainer to do blended finance in Africa. Then I think that's an invitation for all foundation to do that. But maybe we before we go to, to that, maybe more deeper, Bernard. What what's your view on the impact first and 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 the requirements around that? Yeah, I mean that's an interesting question. What is investable and and uh, because usually with, with with our grant money we would go in and take much higher risk than we would do, of course, with the this imp impact investment facilities where we really want to preserve the capital. Um, we, we, we have these struggles when we screen companies uh, in that context and in, in that niche that we are looking at. Um, some companies are, are operate in a kind of a gray area. <laughs> so they, they, it's just, just very plain simple. They, 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 they struggle to have everything in the books. So they have books and they have something out in, next to the books for, for a variety of reasons. There's no judgment in it. In it. Um, so for us, it's really important that we really have a full overview. We have a, a clear uh, um, statements of accounts there. We have an overview of the assets. Uh, and um, so we very much look into that and, and see also where the journey is going, where the, where, where the company is heading and see if that's something we can accept and, and work with them. I mean, first of all, and I forgot that to mention, first of all, is uh, also the, the legal frameworks in, 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 the, in the countries. Uh, it's not easy in all <laughs> where we want to. Uh, so also just the, the, the legal opinions on, you know, the, our, our, our loans, how we could then legally enforce them, um, transfer of capital that, that really uh, limits all, us already from a few interesting uh, opportunities. Um, and we also, I would like to highlight, we don't invest in startups. Huh? We really invest in companies that have a, a, a proven business model, uh, that 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 have uh, um, lo long-term relationships with, with with buyers and and and, and suppliers, um, and see where we can support them and and, and, and scale it. So so there is already a, a, at least a, a attraction there, so to speak, uh, and and we we come along that 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 path. Um, so, so the, it's it's not that we have a, a, a return lens first, saying I need, we need to get out x x percent of that in investment. We we really want to, of course, cover cover our costs and, and keep the capital revolving. Um, but we really say we it, it's really about the impact. We want that more more families in rural areas are reached and have better income and em employment opportunities, either because they provide products to companies we work with or that they can source uh, uh, better products and services from the company that that go into these these areas so this is really the 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 key the key for us um that that's that's us as an ngo that's what we stand for and and uh, therefore the the impact is, is 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 crucial for us the number of people we reach how 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 does it uh, positively influence their their lives um, and, and make that more sustainable. That's that's really key key for us, uh, and that's I think what, 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 why we why we also that's why we are also accepting a higher level of risk. I would say. Excellent. Um, Frederick, and I think it, may, yes. I make a, may I make one other point just Absolutely. to make sure that go go, go ahead, Ladi. <laughs> thank you. Just to ensure that we're also on the same page. Um, so you know the the issue of whether you are being catalytic by coming in early or only looking at transactions that are immediately commercially viable. I wanted to clarify that. With blended finance, you can blend at a point in time within a transaction, a project, a company, you know, fund, whatnot, but you can also blend over you know, the entire life cycle, project life cycle, company life cycle. So you might have a company today that everybody is investing in um, and is very commercially uh, viable, is profitable, 
But the reason why that company exists today is because 10 years ago, um, a foundation gave them a grant to get started. We would still consider that to be blended finance, even though it's over a 10 year period and you're not thinking about you know, the initial grant capital that they received um, when they were first getting started. So I just wanted to be clear on that, that even as I talk about investability, it's not necessarily limited to that point in time. You might, um, you still are gonna look at the financial projections you know, and, and the basic other uh, metrics that you would evaluate when you're doing your appraisal to see is there potential for this company ultimately, even if it's in five or 10 years, if I believe that there is that potential and I'm willing to come in you know, at this very risky stage with my capital, knowing that there's a possibility that it won't materialize, but if it does, then it is gonna create this impact. So I just wanted to be clear Absolutely. about that as well. That you can also blend over the, the life cycle. And it's a very, very good point you make here, you know, which, which makes me also think about the future, you know, I mean, uh, Bernard mentioned today, there is no blended in, in, in the work they do. They're actually doing impact first, but thinking about the future, there is the leveraging of certain companies and the fact that you need to make them attractive for private investors who are looking for return. Um, and there, a blended in a form of de-risking makes even more sense, you know. So I think you, we can see here in, in just these two examples you're presenting the the, diff, uh, the different levels where you can actually implement blended finance um, in, in de-risking or in helping to create or to to scale uh, the company. Maybe one question that I have, which is linked to that, is that when we talk about blending, one one form of blending is also the technical assistance. Um, both of you, is it necessary today, technical assistance? Are you implementing uh, sporadically or, or, or generally? Could you say a few words about that? Bernard, do you want to go first since I went first the last time? For okay. Equal? <laughs> yes, thanks, Lade. Uh, yes, I, I, I would agree. And I think that's also our learnings now. Uh, I think we, we we want to be close to the company and uh, that TA also helps us. The company also expresses uh, the, the need for support, help um, when it comes to, you know, looking at their, 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 their bookkeeping system, just very, ha really very hands-on on things or the governance structure, uh, because sometimes they are family-run businesses. Uh, what, 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 how, how do you make that more sustainable? Uh, um, and and how do you keep keep, keep the, the the employees uh, on, on board? So there, there are all a number of questions. Huh? The same is also where we of course have a, quite a bit of expertise is in the, their relationships with the farmers. Uh, what kind of relationship contractual relationship do they have? What kind of price negotiations do they have, etc. So so I think when it comes to certification questions. We, we, in other projects, we did a lot of organic and fair trade certification projects. That's something our, our companies look for. Um, and I think that's, that's where TA is important. It, it, it helps the company to, to, to get an edge in their, their market. Uh, it, it helps us to be closer to the investment and also to, to safeguard that investment better. And we can increase uh, the impact of the investment uh, by, you know, having better agricultural practices or or, or more transparent uh, bookkeeping systems in, in place. So I think it's 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 it's, a, it's a, almost a triple win situation if 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 we go for that. The challenge is always <laughs> to find enough uh, TA uh, funds. Huh? That's 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 of course the 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 other question. So I guess that's that's something we 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 are still looking for 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 different options how how to. Uh, do that, but yes. Uh, so the answer is yes, and the, there are these these ben benefits I mentioned for us as well as for the company. And I would echo um, what Bernard has said. And you know, we do. You know, the Alphamity Foundation has uh, since inception provided technical assistance to portfolio companies. And what you'll find is that um, all the companies uh, generally need some form of TA, either before, during, or after investment. Um, it can be applied to everything from building management capacity, as Bernard stated, to you know helping them improve their sales and marketing, um, even having tighter financial controls, um, you know financial reporting. 
So there is many different applications of, of uh, technical assistance. I do want to emphasize that uh, our TA is gender smart. So we're always incorporating a gender lens into the assistance that we're providing. And as I mentioned previously, you know, the companies that have received this TA from us have noticed that it has not only created that positive social impact, but it does have um, a positive uh, impact also on their bottom line at the end of the day. And we recently concluded and published a report looking at specific um, types of gender uh, TA interventions. So this is through uh, G-Search, which is, which is a mouthful, but it's the Gender Smart Enterprise Assistance uh, Research Coalition. And I will uh, be happy to share that as well. The report is publicly available. Where over a period of two years, um, Alpha Mindy Foundation, along five other impact investors, AHL Ventures, Root Capital, SEIF, uh, Shell Foundation, um, Acumen, uh, we provided TA to 21 SMEs in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, different types of TA. And then we observed, obviously, limited, um, a limited sample size and a limited uh, implementation period. But again, we observed um, you know, the positive impact, and we've published the insights. So, you know, questions around how you design technical assistance, um, some of the challenges that we experienced, how we overcame them, but also the methodology that we utilize. Because what we found is that a lot of people want to do this, but then there's really no scientific process and everybody's kind of reinventing the wheel. So we are trying to help to standardize, uh, you know, TA within the investment, impact investment uh, industry. So this is publicly available and anybody who's interested in replicating this within their own portfolios can uh, draw some insights uh, from the methodology and also the report and the case studies that we have published. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I see quite a few questions going in, in quite a few different directions on macro risk or legal issues. Um, but let me take, take that one, I think, because and it speaks a little bit to my heart as well, that um, the legal framework in the US is since so many years very favorable for foundations that want to make investments and that they are basically have uh, ways to, to you know, make convertible investments uh, or uh, you know, a foundation may make direct investments which are completely free of tax. Now, in Switzerland, especially, it's quite a different uh, regime and it, it's actually very much a split between the cantons and you don't have a, a common uh, rule of law. Um, I don't know how it is in Africa for you, Lade, but do you want to say maybe a few words on that? Is it a hindrance to, to move towards these impact first investments that, that we are discussing here or how, how do you see that? Maybe Bernard first. I know you. I lost you for oh. about ten. I lost you for about ten seconds, Frederick. <laughs> oh, did did you understand the question? We were talking about the the, the legal frameworks and the fact that uh, such impact first investment can and should be detaxed in 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 the respective country where you where you do them. Um, so within the African context, I'm not aware of um, outside of, you know, the likes of maybe South Africa and, and a couple of others. Generally, um, there is no incentive for uh, philanthropy. So you're not getting, you know, any tax breaks necessarily for doing that. Uh, the U.S. is uh, a very sophisticated and advanced market where you have, you know, this uh, legal framework in place, but you generally will not find that here. And philanthropy is seen as a way of life anyway. So um, giving brownie points for doing it is, is not necessarily um, something that, that I have seen uh, in this region. Interesting. Yeah, yes, I think it's, I mean, I think there was the comment of, uh, I think it was from Tim um, regarding the context in Switzerland, and indeed, that is not uh, e easy. Uh, as I said, we were registered here as a, as a foundation, um, and, and we are looking at different options. So we were thinking of uh, basically uh, um, a company where we can issue shares and, and basically onboard others, but that has a, a lot of implications. Um, you fall under new laws that we are <laughs> currently not under, uh, collecting capital here in Switzerland, et cetera, that has a lot of compliance and regulation issues, and that makes it extremely complicated. So we're looking also at different options in other con European contexts uh, for a fund structure. 
uh, and there are some some possibilities at there, but there we are, we are getting different uh, legal 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 advice. Uh, because it's 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 one thing is is to do it on that scale, but uh, well, our plans are different. So I think therefore we need to have a, um, a, a different uh, legal legal entity. And I think similar in the, in the country that was also pointed out some some indeed it's important that we have their free flow of of capital in and out. Otherwise, it's, it's it will be very difficult for for us to onboard other investors. One one other question uh, come up on the. On the macro risk, you know, I mean, the, the, the specifically the countries in Africa are, are, have been subject to quite a few specific events or, or, or macro events at the local region. How do you protect yourself against this? Or how do you view this this risk um, within the different countries you operate or want to operate? Latte, you have the, the answer. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't have the answer, but you know, some some things that investors would normally consider would be obviously political risk insurance, um, which is quite expensive. Also, means that you're increasing the cost of capital for your transaction. Um, beyond that, is you know, partnering with um, local investors um, or even getting DFIs involved because DFIs, um, even if you're not formally purchasing uh, political risk insurance, their presence, um, you know, mitigates any possible uh, political interference with your transaction just because of the soft power that they hold within many of these uh, countries. So what you'll find is um, a number of investors will typically look for a DFI participation uh, in a transaction before going in, or they will outright purchase um, political risk insurance. The other thing is, you know, only operating in markets uh, where the political risk or the political climate is stable and where you don't have uh, these high uh, fluctuations and exposure to, uh, you know, coups and, and things of that nature. So um, some investors will only um, invest in some key markets, which unfortunately also means that, you know, uh, other countries that really need uh, the catalytic capital are being excluded just because of the political risk. So there are formal ways um, in which you can uh, mitigate that risk, and there are also uh, informal ways that you can you can do so. Yeah, maybe if I just may, may add on that, Frederick, is it okay? Yes, please. Just, just uh, briefly. I mean, we have, we also have this discussion, and and also you saw our initial selection. Uh, Uganda and, and Senegal, and that was exactly for, for these reasons reason Latte just mentioned. They're looking at the legal frameworks, looking at security, looking at the political landscape. landscape. Because from a development or a humanitarian point of view, you know, um, I would we would be in DRC Congo. Uh, that's where we are with our humanitarian aid program, but we will not go in with this facility uh, for a number of reasons. And I don't want to mention any other countries, but it's it's. So this this is this is informs it, but that also limits us a bit. Um, and and the other one, what what uh, Latte said, uh, looking for also local local ownership, local co investments. That's also a good part where we we seeing where that is possible. And also we made sure I haven't mentioned that on our investment committee we we also uh, brought in um, context uh, knowledge, context business knowledge. So we have people from the respective countries or at least from the societies and, and, and business people who have an understanding of, of uh, the investment landscape. And that also helps us in our, our discussion to get more to a better informed um, decision. And, and you see where I'm leading to, you know, because I think from, from locally ownership and locally presence, comes the, the question about the local currency. Would it be better to do all the activities in the local currency? Isn't that something that, that you've, you've considered or what are the hindrances to do that? Um, obviously the answer is yes, but uh, you know, given uh, the high volatility of many of the local currencies as a foreign investor, um, their challenges. And also, you know, depending on the type of investment it is, you know, some companies will need FX anyway, because they're um, exporting, importing uh, 
uh, items and you know they need access to hard currency. So it makes sense for at least a portion of the investment to be in hard currency. Um, as an investor, you are taking a risk because you're you are exposed to FX fluctuations and you know the currency volatility. So for some investors, again, there's the option to hedge, uh, but again, that's expensive. Um, so that is something to consider. Um, some investors will also only look at companies that have you know some sort of export because that means that they are mm -hmm. you know indirectly mitigating their exposure to uh, local currency risk because these companies are going to earn um, hard currency from their exports. So I think there's a variety of um, you know approaches that you can adopt, but it's never an easy solution, but ideally, um, we should be investing in local currency. Uh, I think some of the more stable and the larger economies, it's easier to do so. But in some of the smaller ones, you know, it's um, not, not so much. Fully clear. And if I may add another question for you, Lade, you know, given that you were four years with Convergence, you know, isn't there a market there for, for, for DFIs to step in and provide uh, hedging for such local currency investment. I mean, we know well the, the TCX model, which is uh, a big fund that uh, microfinance institutions use, and I used it a lot when I was at Blue Orchard, but uh, they're, still, they're still small globally uh, in global thinking. And, you know, would there be some specific needs in Africa? And could not the African Development Bank do something like this? Yeah, I was actually going to mention TCX, um, so, but again, TCX, TCX is expensive, um, so you have to uh, consider that. Uh, the you know regional DFI is African Development Bank, uh, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, Trade and Development Bank Group, and others. Um, they do are able to lend in local currency. Um, I don't think it's for all uh, all countries, but you know the major currencies they are able to lend, um, and they do uh, so. That is something that they themselves, you know, it, it's a product that they themselves provide. So I think it exists. But at the end of the day, you know, you, I don't think you can ever fully um, hedge against um, local currency risk. If we're being honest. Fair, fair enough. Yes. Bernard, a, a thought on the. Yeah, yes. I mean, um, indeed. I mean, Ideally and and naturally, uh, lo local currency uh, loans it would be, um, for a number of reasons that are not always possible. Let, let's let's we have some context where the local currency is packed to the USD, so then it's easier. Um, we do in some context also we we split the loan amount, so we have uh, one tranche, one one part of the loan agreement is in 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 USD, and the second one is uh, in in local currency. Uh, just to also mitigate that a bit, the, the risk for 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 the company, and we share a bit more than the currency risk. Um, it depends also, of course, on the business model. So we have uh, uh, some of the the agriculture processing companies. They also um, export their products, so then they have a hard currency uh, revenue that helps again. Uh, then we have no concerns at all to to basically have the loan in hard currency. Um, so it's it's a it's a discussion. It's a discussion. We don't hedge because we are too small for for that, and we, we really. Uh, but ideally, yeah, that could be a niche for others to come in, come in because it, in, it, it would definitely help help a lot. Uh, we, we we have this discussion. We see what kind of risk we can accept, uh, but majority is still in USD uh, for for us. Thank you. No, I, I'm fully aware that the hedging is costly. I think it. Um... When you look at the the returns that microfinance institutions give, you 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 see it right there. I mean, the, the huge portion of the return is 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 taken by the by the hedging in in these countries. Very interesting. Um, I'm looking if there is other questions uh, coming up. I think I think we're pretty much going um, to the end here. I may have forgot one or two, but I'm happy to. If um, if people can directly reach out to, to Lade or Bernard with their question. Um, so I, I want to thank you both for this uh, presentation and exchange on uh, Impact First in Africa. I think it's, it's uh, really interesting and it's a, a, growing, a growing segment as we hear from both of you. 
And then with that, I, I have nothing much more to say, but I would give the word to, to Tim if you have a few other words in that team. Thank you, Fred. Uh, my thanks to, to Lade and, and Bernard for really great insights uh, from, from, uh, from your practice. Uh, I think it's very inspiring. Um, of course, in, in one single conversation, we will not solve the equation of sustainable development and impact investing for foundations and philanthropies, uh, but we are on the right path here. And my thanks to all those who participated in the call. Um, I think if you can follow up with, with us and for impact, with Impact for Breakfast, with your uh, questions, comments, if you want to share uh, your, your business models uh, and your impact investing models in future conferences, let us know. Um, and we will be producing a, a summary, uh, I think, of this, uh, of this webinar uh, and sharing it together with all the presentations with all of those who registered for it. Um, so, uh, Deborah, over to you and my thanks to Impact for Breakfast. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. Also, my thanks to the speakers for such great insights shared today. And of course, Tim and Frederick for being our co-hosts and moderating this session. It was uh, very pleasant and um, very informative. Um, I will be doing a follow-up note, um, sharing this recording with you and the recording of part one. And of course, also the presentation and the contact details of our speakers. And um, please reach out to them directly if you have questions and if you know anyone in your network that should meet our speakers and should know about them and about their work please make sure to connect them and uh, and yeah that's uh, it was a wonderful session thank you very much and um, if you have any suggestions for future sessions please reach out to us as well i look forward for part three with uh, tim and frederick i uh, wish you all a wonderful day ahead and look forward to seeing you soon at another impact for breakfast session take care everybody Thank you and happy Bye. Thanksgiving, everyone. Yes, <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye.